Hi guys, it's Farouk here, and welcome to day two of Orthodontics in Conference, where we're looking at the 9th International Orthodontic Congress by the WFO, and we're looking at day two. So this time we're going to look at nine lectures, and we're going to cover a range of topics from the classic retention, but then the focus really is on the newer or the hot topics within orthodontics, looking at accelerated tooth movement, airway, especially looking at obstructive sleep apnea, and also patient expectations, the softer side of things as it's sometimes known. We've got a star-studded number of speakers, including Parag Fleming, Martin Coburn, Stephen Lindor, and Susan Cunningham, just to name a few. Lectures will f the lectures will have some notes, I do promise it, it will happen by the end of this week. Hope you guys enjoy this, please do subscribe. I'll catch up with you at the end of the episode, where I'll go through a few of my reflections from day two at the IOC, uh, and also please do subscribe if you do enjoy the episodes. Welcome to the Orthodontics in Conference podcast, where Farouk brings you the summary of key lectures from orthodontic conferences around the world, with your host, Farouk Ahmed. Next is a lecture entitled, Adjuncts to Orthodontic Tooth Movement, Are They Really Worth the Bother? Now this was by Martin Coburn. Now I really liked Martin's lecture. He went through what defined normal orthodontic tooth movement and then what's been written in the literature most contemporary about what can cause things to move quicker. He also evaluated the quality of that evidence as well, which is the key when it comes to interpreting evidence-based practice. So to start off with, so what is conventional orthodontic tooth movement duration? How long does treatment take? This was a study by Aliki Tishlaki in 2016, and it showed the average orthodontic tooth movement was 19.9 months from the systematic review, with a mean number of visits of 18. Well, what is it that patients expect? Well, Arrive in 2014 showed that actually most patients want treatment done within 6 to 12 months. And actually 70% of orthodontists are interested in how we can move teeth quicker. Well, what is the actual force required to move teeth? Now this is really interesting. A systematic review by Theodoro in 2019 showed actually we still don't have firm answers to this question. There's a suggestion that it's 50 centinewtons to 100 centinewtons, but the evidence is still quite poor. And we still don't fundamentally understand what force is required to achieve certain tooth movements. Next, Martin went through eight different adjuncts that have been considered to accelerate tooth movement. So starting off with the old self ligating bracket question. Well, the systematic review by Papa Giorgio in 2013 showed actually there's a very small difference between the two between conventional and self-ligating, slightly in favour of conventional ligation when it comes to the speed of, of treatment. Next was looking at, well, what about arch wire sequence? And if you change the sequence of wires to get things going quicker? Well, the Cochrane review by Wang in 2018, so there's no difference in the arch wire sequence affecting the speed of treatment. Next was looking at customised appliances. So they could potentially be more efficient. We're planning from a specific end point and also we're using customized arch wires and prescriptions so theoretically there's lots there to state that it's going to be quicker but penning in 2017 found that actually the appliance doesn't really influence the end outcome and actually it's the orthodontist that has a bigger role to play next moving on to the surgical interventions so corticotomy so corticotomy is a bone cut that takes place and the premise is, is that there's a regional accelerated phenomenon that takes place through this intentional trauma. There's an increase in metabolism and therefore greater turnover of tooth of bone takes place and movement. Systematic review by Gill this time in 2018 showed that there is a reduction in treatment time of eight months versus 16 months without this intervention. But the evidence was really quite poor. A systematic review by Fleming in 2015 showed that there are significant effects on space closure. However, this was only two millimeters and it was only over a three month period. So again, the evidence was considered to be quite poor. Moving on to something surgical, but less evasive, moving on to micro osteoperforation. Systematic review by Surajan in 2020 showed there's no difference when it comes to canine retraction using this form of surgical intervention. Interesting, that was different to the outcomes of another systematic review by Shahabi in 2019 that showed, well, there is a significant effect that takes place for canine retraction, but it's a small order. We're looking at 0.45 millimetres 
per increase per month. Moving on to piezocision. So piezocision is a less evasive form than the surgical interventions described so far. Well, what is it? Well, it's an ultrasonic bone saw, which is used without having to create a flap. Now, there's two systematic reviews based around this, one by Afsal 2020 and one by Mehsen as well. And both of them actually show the same thing. It is significantly effective. Afsal found that it's quicker when it comes to anterior tooth alignment of 46 days. And Mehsen showed that it's quicker when it comes to canine retraction. So there is premise with this particular treatment, although, again, the number of papers were limited. Next, moving on to vibrational devices. So these are devices which are non-surgically involved. Patients put them in their mouths for 5 to 30 minutes per day. Now, there have been three randomized controlled trials that Martin mentioned about this. Mills 2008, Woodhouse 2015, and Katachu in 2018 all showed the same thing. There's no increase in the rate of tooth movement using this device, whether it's fixed appliances or whether it's aligners. Now, the last intervention that Martin spoke about was photobiomodulation. And this was the first time I've heard about this. It was really interesting. It's about using a, a light wave, which is specific, which activates cellular processes. This increases cellular activity, which can result in the increase in cellular turnover and therefore tooth movement. Now, there was a systematic review by Al Shaharani in 2019 showed that there is a statistical difference supporting this intervention, but it wasn't clinically significant. Now, Martin concluded by interpreting this information into his own clinical practice. And he said, although there are some promising ideas here, especially the photobiomodulation, at the moment, the evidence is too weak to incorporate it into his own clinical practice. Next was Parag Fleming's lecture entitled Orthodontic Retention, Not Letting Go. He started off by describing Little's classic paper from 1999, and he described how there are changes that take place after orthodontic treatment related to two things. One, orthodontic treatment relapse, but also maturation changes. And Little recommended at that point in time indefinite retention because of these two variables. So what Padraig Fleming did very succinctly was to divide up different features of relapse and then describe them in detail. Now, the second part of his lecture looked really at fixed retainers and looked at the, the clinical components to it. He started off by looking at overbite stability. Now, overbite stability has been considered to be unstable. However, when we look at the papers by Schwartz uh, Franson in 2006, it showed that actually long term wise, there's less than a millimeter of change. And Parag argued that the vertical changes that take place tend to relate to lower incisor relapse. A tooth has slipped contact points, and therefore it's free to extrude vertically. But actually, if we could maintain the lower arch alignment, we're more likely to have overbite stability. Then went on to describe interdigitation, which is first described by Panchurst in, in 1982. And he theorized that, well, if we have interdigitation, we're going to have good stability. And I think generally that idea is accepted. It was only really investigated by Porreg and his team in a paper by Oliver in 2020 where they looked at stability associated with interdigitation, found actually only 10% of patients had relapse when they had good interdigitation. He then went on to speak about the types of retainers and also their regime. The appliance type has been described in Simon Littlewood's Cochrane Review, and it supports vacuum form retainers over Hawley's. However, the literature only looked at six months' worth of data. Now, the type of retainer regime... Well, he said that part-time versus full-time has been shown to be more effective for part-time. And in fact, Porig advocated part-time as it had less consequences to the wear on the retainer. But the type of retainer and long-term effects hadn't really been investigated. Well, Porig and his team did a study on this, and Al Magrabi in 2016 and 2017 did a four-year follow-up study. And they were looking at a relatively simple difference between appliances, that of fixed retainers and that of vacuum form retainers. And they found after this extensive period of time that the irregularity with fixed retainers was 0.8 millimetres, yet with vacuum form retainers it was 2.4 millimetres, both a statistically and clinically significant difference. 
interesting when they looked at compliance of wearers of vacuum form retainers, they found that on average people wore it five hours less than they were prescribed. And actually at two years, only 33% of patients were compliant. When it comes to how to increase compliance, well, Porog and his team developed an app to encourage people to wear their retainers. But they found actually it didn't make an overall difference. People were still not wearing it as they were recommended to do so, and the app itself only had an increase in about an hour's worth of wear. Now, when it comes to complications of retainers, or well, the vacuum form retainers, there's a good chance that they're going to fracture at some stage, and, and Poro recommended using a thicker material, changing to a 1.5 millimeter thickness over the conventional 0.6. Now, when it comes to fixed retainers, well, from Poro's studies, it showed that 30% of patients will have a breakage within the first three years, so that's one in three. However, he gave some top tips as to how to reduce fixed retainer fractures. So first of all, he described the convention of using a twist flex material, which is relatively rigid and therefore less likely to get a fracture. But Parag mentioned that actually, because it's so rigid, a force, if it is slightly active on clusal forces, can result in quite a large force being propagated, which causes movement of the tooth or loss of bonding. Now, using something which is less rigid, such as flex tech, is what Parag recommends he's changed to now. This won't generate that same force, so therefore we are not going to get tooth movement happening with the retainer in situ. But he made the, uh, he made the understanding that actually we aren't going to have the same rigidity, so therefore it may fracture. But at least with the appliance or the retainer in situ, it hasn't caused tooth movement to take place. Now Paro gave his tips as to how to avoid debonding of fixed retainers. Now he said he likes to now use a large amount of composite pad on that palatal surface. So he creates a broad yet shallow profile of the composite. And he said that this means that there's less wire which is exposed and therefore you're less likely to get fractures taking place. Now Fleming gave his hierarchy of stability when it comes to orthodontic treatment. He described how one of the most stable outcomes we have is the anterior posterior correction, especially if we achieve that interdigitation. Vertical, well, deep bite, although it was postulated to be unstable, actually has been shown to be relatively stable now in our evidence. Now, transverse relapse does occur. We need to think about using more rigid retention when it comes to it. One of the biggest relapse rates that we have is actually vertical, but in the anterior open bite cases. And for this, he suggested using active retention long term. Now, Poro gave his conclusions on this, and he's changed his own clinical practice with light of the research and also his clinical experience. So now he looks more, much more to use, towards using a bonded retainer, specifically in the lower arch in every patient and mostly in the upper arch as well, reducing his reliance upon vacuum form retainers. I thought this was really interesting because if patients aren't going to wear them, then actually, what is the point of relying upon them? So he looks at interdigitation as being one of his main outcomes. Next was a lecture by Carlos Mir, and this was entitled The Application of Evidence into Daily Orthodontic Clinical Decisions, The Interrupted Teeth Story. So Carlos described the decision-making process with canine impaction, and it was canine impaction that his lecture was based around. He went over the first half of his lecture, which is what we know and can help us make that decision. And then he was bold enough to ask questions where actually after carrying out the research, we still don't actually have answers to for canine impactions. So the decision making when it comes to canine impactions. Well, what we do know from Zeno's really good paper from 2018, and it showed that if the canine overlaps the medial aspect of the center incisor, we've got a really poor prognosis impacted canine. Also, if the angle of the canine is greater than 30 degrees, we're looking at a poor prognosis canine. Now, the paper goes into far more detail and do suggest that the listeners go and have a look at that one. Got some really nice diagrams in it as well. Next was the question, well, when or if we should extract the primary canine? Now, in the literature, the decision has changed over the years, but our norm over has done a really comprehensive piece of research published in 2018. And the answer to the question is, well, we should be in the right situation. And what is that? Well, that's when the palatally displaced canine is in sector two or three. So to you and I, that's when the canine tip is overlapping either the mesial or the distal aspect of the lateral incisor. 
cone beam seam T's, do we need to take them? Well, the consensus paper for the American Association of Radiology showed that your cone beam CT should be justified on an individual patient basis. Well, cone beam CTs have been shown to be more accurate. However, when we look at a study by Boxvest in 2019, it showed that comparing plain radiographs to cone beam CTs showed that actually there was quite good agreement between the two when it came to canine impaction. But still, the bottom line is that chromium CTs are more accurate. What he mentioned is that we can make that statement, but we don't know where that lies in the realms of patient outcomes, and if that advantage actually has a difference to patient outcomes. Then Carlos went to talk about four other points where we don't actually have the right answers yet. So the first was the follicle. So the follicle was proposed as a predisposing factor for, for resorption of the adjacent tooth. This was by Erickson in 2001. The sizes have been written in the literature as well. Normal size is 2.3 millimeters at a minimum, whereas when, it's, when the tooth is ectopic, there's a larger follicle which is there, between 2.7 millimeters plus. Now, even with a cone beam CT, what can't be distinguished is when is their follicle pathological? When is that follicle actually going to cause resorption? And that's something we still don't have the answers to. Next was the timing. Well, when should we do something about the impacted canine? Well, we know that we should remove the supernuma tooth, for example, if that's part of the cause of the impacted tooth. However, it's unclear as to whether what the ideal chronological time is for this. Next is about the exposure for the impacted canine. Well interesting there isn't any strong evidence to suggest a particular point in time is more advantageous than another. Now what Carlos said is that he spoke to a leading world authority in Adrian Becker and he asked well when, when do you think is the best time because there isn't any evidence on this and, and he suggested the age of eight is an ideal time to decide whether or not two should be exposed or not. But this is purely author opinion, and actually we still need some evidence to support that. Lastly, and probably the most crucial question, is can we predict if a patient is going to have an impacted canine? The RIBE showed in 2016, looking at a whole host of factors, looking at cephalometric, uh, plain radiographs, but also looking at study models as well, and found that actually there is no predictor to an impacted canine. And this still very much remains the holy grail of research of impacted teeth. Next, we have a lecture by Leslie Will, which was entitled Update on Orthognathic Surgery, Long-Term Stability and the Relationship to the Airway. So this was a, an interesting presentation where Leslie described a hot topic of airway changes and looked at what affects orthognathic surgery as one of the proposed treatments for it. So the first bit of the lecture looked at a cone beam scene T investigation of orthognathic patients and changes to their airway. Now what she made quite clear here is that the changes that took place with three different types of surgery, whether it's maxillary advancement, mandibular advancement or by maxillary procedure, the changes are very much restricted to the oropharynx when it comes to significant changes that happen. She broke down each bit of those surgery. So maxillary advancement had an increase in 76%. The mandibular advancement in 49%. And a biomaxillary procedure had the greatest at 143% increase. But what Leslie also did was to break down, well, what are the variables that result in this increase in change? And they looked at cephalometric values and showed that for every one millimeter of advancement of the greater palatine foramen, i.e. the maxilla, a 2,000 millimeter increase in the volume area. When it came to looking at the downwards movement, what she found that was for every one millimeter of downwards movement of PNS, i.e. the posterior maxilla, there was a 1,000 millimeter cubic increase in volume. And these seem to be the two variables that result in the greatest increase. So what didn't change? Well, what she made quite clear is that the nasopharynx stayed the same. And actually, if patients have obstructions in this region, we are looking at a different form of treatment, and orthognathic surgery is not indicated. The second part of the lecture was simply looking at the stability of orthognathic surgery. But we're looking at a three-part maxillary advancement, 
with also combined with the BSSO advancement as well. Now this was a cone beam CT study with CTs taken before treatment, just after surgery and also 18 months further down the line. Now what was found here? Well, in the three-part maxilla, what they found was actually there was relapse that took place posteriorly. So although the posterior maxilla was set down, it relapsed by one and a half to two millimeters posteriorly. Now the advancement forward relapsed by half a millimeter, but there was no change in the third dimension, the transverse change, there was no relapse that took place. When it came to the BSSO advancement, actually it was found that the mental foramen relapsed by 2.5 millimeters, i.e. the proximal region had relapsed and gone further backwards. And an interesting finding that the interlingular, so the transverse dimension of the posterior, the distal aspect of the mandible, had reduced in distance by 2.8 millimeters, which I think is interesting. And the, and, and the reason wasn't given, but what we can see is that there are transverse changes that take place as well. Then went on to describe the condyles. Now, I think this is always an interesting point of conversation. Well, what she showed was that actually immediately after this surgery, the condyle was repositioned posteriorly and more medially by about a millimeter in each dimension. Now, after 18 months after the surgery, the condyles pretty much returned to back where they started. And she described the overall relapse of a bimaxillary advancement, so this three-part maxilla with the, with the BSSO advancement, at 18%. But she indicated that there was no occlusal changes that took place in this, no purely skeletal. Next was a lecture by Juan Palomo, and it was entitled Sleep Apnea and the Orthodontist. Now, I liked this lecture because obstructive sleep apnea is one of those topics which is shrouded in mystery, uh, and Juan did a great job at explaining obstructive sleep apnea, but also going through contemporary evidence when it comes to the treatment modalities with it. So he started off by describing sleep and how sleep is a requirement. And if we don't have sleep after 11 days, we're likely to die. Um, he described the function of sleep. So it's a restorative process. It restores us from the functions of the day. And actually, there's been some science behind this reparative process and how sleep functions to remove the neurotoxins from the brain. And that was by Z in 2013. Now, obstructive sleep apnea, while the prevalence is about 4%, but it's been su suggested it's underreported. That's by Bradley in 2002. OSA has been shown to co possibly contribute to neurodegeneration in older patients. And it can cause a whole host of side effects, such as diabetes, stroke, depression, insomnia. But what Juan explained was that actually this is due to the apnea events happening. This idea that there's a deoxygenization that takes place, which then consequently results in these conditions over a longer period. How is it measured? Well, there's the apnea hypopnea index, the AHI. And what does this do? Well, it's a measurement of the number of times the patient's upper airway collapses. And the, this collapsing has to last for at least 10 seconds where there is no breathing. And that should result in a deoxygenation in the blood. So that's what can give rise to those consequences of diabetes, stroke and, in, and hypertension. Now, it's got a scale of mild, moderate or severe. And to qualify for obstructive sleep apnea, you have to have at least five events taking place. Moderate is 15 to 30, and anything severe is greater than that. But what he drew attention to was for our paediatric patients, this scale may be misleading, and actually having one or two of these events can affect children's performance. He spoke about a questionnaire which helps explore some of the patient-related features of obstructive sleep apnea, and it's freely available at www.stonebang, that's S-T-O-N-B-A-N-G dot C-A. He then went on to speak about obstructive sleep apnea in children. Now, again, from my perspective, I feel as though this is the greyest of the grey area when it comes to obstructive sleep apnea. So he described the prevalence, which is less than the adults, at about 1% to 3%, perhaps explaining why we have less knowledge about it. He described it as an interruption in the restorative process. But children express this differently at that age. They're not going to have some of the other significant morbidity effects that happen in adults. But for children, things like hyperactivity are common to take place, which can result in misdiagnosis of ADHD. Described clinically, we've got to also be looking at tonsils for these younger patients. 
Now, there is imagery which is possible, but he, drew down, he explained the limitations of it. We've got 3D with cone beam CTs. However, we're not looking at for static interpretation of the airway. We really want to have a dynamic interpretation. Well, we're still waiting for that to come out and be something robust. He then went on to describe treatments. So he started off actually by looking at oral exercises. I thought this was really interesting. He described how in a paper by Ward in 2012, he looked at patients who play wind instruments and they had a reduced risk of obstructive sleep apnea. And there are exercises which are available to help strengthen the oropharyngeal muscles to prevent this collapse of the, of the upper airway. And there's some, there's some exercises by Vanessa et al. which have been published. Next, and a common etiological factor is patient weight, so weight loss. Now, he quantified this. So if a patient has a reduction in 10% in their weight, it's actually a 20% reduction when it came to the AHI scale. That's by Yi in 2006. Now, clinical treatments that can take place, well, from orthodontist perspective, there's rapid maxillary expansion in its variety of forms. Now, a systematic review showed that actually a there's a reduction in AHI scores of up to 70% for patients. There's an increase in the O2 saturation in the patient's blood. And this was by 9%. And that was Camacho in 2017 that showed this. Now, there are different types of splints which have been proposed. There's a mandibular advancement splint, the MAS. But there's also things that patients can buy off the, cell, off the shelf, which are tongue stabilizing appliances. Now, these are interesting and they work in different modalities, but in fact, they're both there to try and keep the airway patent and keep the airway open. Now, there's a study by Sutherland in 2011, which showed that actually the MAS, the mandibular advancement splint, was more effective when compared to the tongue stabilizing appliance. I thought this was a really good lecture to not only give an overview of the, of the grey topic, but also to provide the treatment modalities that are available and the evidence behind them. Next was studied by Wan Moon, entitled Non-Surgical Expansion with Mid-Facial Skeletal Expander, MSE, for Upper Airway Obstruction. Now, this is where Moon spoke us through the use of mid-facial skeletal expanders. And what is that? Well, well that is, in effect, RME uh, with combined with TADS. Now, there are four TADS which are placed with this expansion screw. There are two placed in the anterior segment and two placed posterior in a, in a square arrangement. Now, there is another term given to this as well, which is MARPI, which is Mini Screw Assisted Rapid Palatal Expansion. Now, we very clearly started off by defining the difference between MSE, so mid facial skeletal expanders, compared to Mini Screw Assisted Rapid Palatal Expansion palatal expansion, which in my mind, just using the words themselves, sounds like it's the same thing, but he did describe a discernible difference. So the MSE, mid-facial skeletal expander, has a design which engages more posteriorly with the dentition and therefore the maxilla, whereas MARPI can be more anterior. Now that's a distinguishable difference when it comes to how the appliances work. It describes MSE has a greater effect upon the resistors to mid palatal expansion, which is a zygomatic buttress, the pterygo palatine suture, and the mid palatal suture as well. And therefore, being closer to these sites means that we're far more likely to get greater skeletal expansion. And he described how that expansion is different. No, it's a quantitative thing, but actually it's the shape of expansion. So conventionally with RME, for example, we get very much a pyramidal expansion, greater anterior, less in the posterior segment. What he described with the MSE has been shown by Colloch in 2020 that the expansion is parallel, so we get an equal amount of posterior expansion as we get anterior expansion as well. Now when it comes to rapid maxillary expansion, there's also the vertical expansion that takes place. So again, typically around the maxillary or palatal region, it's relatively wide. As we go further towards the nasal bone, it tends to narrow. Again, it's pyramidal in its shape. And what he described again for MSC is that when compared to MRP, we get a far more parallel amount of expansion that takes place. And he described why is, why is there this difference? Ultimately, they both have TADS in. 
he gave the reason as to, well, the tad angulation has a big factor to play. And he described how these vertically inserted tads resulted in this equal amount of force taking place, both at the palatal level, but also higher up in the nasal region as well. Whereas for Marpi, there are angled tads, and therefore the force is less well distributed for the vertical changes. He then went on to describe the greatest resistor to having maxillary expansion, and it's the pterygopalatine suture. And he described how when it comes to conventional surgery, this is something which is uh, removed, this is separated surgically, and it's quite a challenge to do. What they wanted to know really was, does MSC result in changes taking place to the suture? And the study by Kolak in 2020 showed that actually in 84% of cases, MSC achieved pterygopalatine disjunction and separation of this suture. He then went on to the second part of his lecture, which was now to look at, well, what other effects takes place when you use MSC, specifically to do with the airway? He described how small changes to the nasopharynx actually has a significant increase in the airflow that takes place. He investigated this, so patients pre-MSE had 125 uh, volumetric measurements for the nasal airflow. After MSE, it was 175, which was statistically significant, the paper by Zhang. He also described that air turbulence that takes place in the nose can also have a significant impact upon airflow and experiences for the patient. And he showed that with MSE, there's a 28 to 48 PA improvement in the nasal airflow. And that was a paper by Fraser. Finally, he looked at obstructive sleep apnea, the condition itself. And there's a significant reduction that takes place in the AHI scores for apnea patients. Next was a lecture by Sung Hang Beck. And this was also on the topic of obstructive sleep apnea. So he was looking at treatment guidelines for adult obstructive sleep apnea and a perspective on sleep function and facial aesthetics. Now, I think this lecture really, really complemented Juan's lecture very well about how obstructive sleep apnea has developed as a science and where we are up to up today. So he described the classification of the phenotype of adults who have obstructive sleep apnea. This was from his paper in 2020. So it's three types. There's the obesity type, which makes up actually the majority of obstructive sleep apnea patients. That's defined as the BMI greater than 25. And these patients don't really have a soft tissue or skeletal etiology to it. Next is the skeletal type. This is about a third of cases. Now, this is where there's a severe skeletal tooth, usually high angle cases, and there's a physiological cause to this. There's a narrowing of the pharyngeal space. Now, these guys are mainly treated with craniofacial modification or some form of splint therapy that I'll come back to. And the final 15% of patients are this complex case where it's a combination of both the obesity type and the skeletal type, where it's more complex management that's involved. He described other features, which we understand not as well when it comes to obstructive sleep apnea, that of the patient's poor response of their airway muscles and why that is. Also, patients sometimes have a lower arousal for the threshold to their airway. And other people just have unstable ventilation control. He described how these need to be referred on to medical physicians for further investigation. So he went on to describe the mandibular advancement splint. Well, how does it work? Well, it holds the mandible forwards, and that has an implication to the airway space. It enlarges the airway. It also helps to prevent it from collapsing, but it can produce occlusal changes if it's used in the long term, and the TMJ should be healthy before patients have this type of appliance. Now, he also mentioned a paper by Source in 2017 that looked at compliance. And it's interesting that when patients get this appliance, only 25% of patients will stop wearing it in the first year. But when we look at the fifth, the five-year follow-up, actually 63% of patients have stopped wearing this. In effect, the majority are no longer using this appliance. So there are other treatment modalities out there. And there's CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure, which is a mask that the patient wears. 
And that's been shown to be more effective than using a mandibular advancement splint uh, in reducing the AHI scores. And that was Kamaroto in 2017. He then went on to describe orthognathic surgery for correction, and he described how a maxillary mandibular counterclockwise rotation would increase the airway space significantly for patients. But there's been other ideas that if patients don't have OSA, can we cause it by carrying out orthognathic surgery? And what he found was that actually for posterior impaction alone, it's not something which is thought to consider OSA. However, if we combine a posterior impaction with a maxillary setback, that has been shown to cause a trigger for OSA. Next was the difference looking at RME compared to SARP. A systematic review by Abdul Latif in 2017 showed that RME is effective at reducing the AHI scores by 60%. SARP is more effective and has a 77% improvement. And he proposed MARPI, similar to what's been described by Woon in the previous lecture, that actually using mini screw assisted expansion can be advantageous for nasopharyngeal obstruction. Next, the lecturer Song himself proposed a surgery for a complex patient. This is a patient who's got a protrusive maxilla, where actually advancing the maxilla would result in negative facial appearance. So Sung, with his team, has proposed a segmental maxilla and a maxillary mandibular counterclockwise procedure. So I'll just explain how he described this. So the idea is a patient's going to have a three-part to the maxilla. There's going to be extraction of fours at the time of surgery. There's going to be an advancement of the posterior segment uh, into the extraction site. The anterior segment is going to be maintained. Now the BSSO advancement is something which then goes on to follow that. And he described this as a solution for the protrusive maxillary case where they've also got obstructive sleep apnea. It's an interesting idea and I look forward to seeing the author's research on this topic. Next was a lecture by Stephen Lindor. And this was entitled Patient Expectations and the Future of Orthodontics. Here he looked at two aspects of patient expectations, one of the clinical and the second of their treatment provider and their location for it. So he described how the generations have changed as have expectations. And now the current generation are trending towards perfectionism, where they expect more from themselves, but also from people around them and services. This was by Curran in 2019. So he designed a study where, in effect, they took well-aligned arches and changed the posterior occlusal relationships from class 1 to class 2 and class 3 and gave a visual analogue scale. They gave this to patients and parents and also clinicians and said, well, what are you willing to do to get this corrected? And it was interesting findings. What was found was that patients were willing to extend their treatment for up to seven months to get a correction back to a class 1. As orthodontists, actually, were willing to only spend two months less doing it at five months. What about treatment termination? Well, what he found from the study is that actually parents of patients are far less likely to want to terminate their treatment and rather stick in to have longer treatment to get an ideal result than orthodontists were. Now, the second half of the lecture for me was just really, really interesting. It was looking at patients' perception of where they would have the orthodontic treatment. Would it be face-to-face? Would it be teledentistry? Would it be with a dentist? Now, I think in the the realms of COVID and things moving online, this was a really poignant question to start asking patients as to, well, where do they stand and what do they understand? So there's a questionnaire that Lindor put forward where it was asking patients, what provider would they go to to have the orthodontic treatment? And the results were actually comfortingly, the majority would still go to see an orthodontist at 44%. Only 22% would go to their general dentist to have orthodontics. But interestingly and perhaps concerningly, 34% of people in this questionnaire said they'd go for direct consumer orthodontics. Now, what I liked with Lindor's study is that he also then broke down, well, who are these people going to direct consumer? Who are these people going to the orthodontist? What he found was that younger patients were more likely to go to an orthodontist. And actually, it was the older patients, the 40s and 50s, 
who are more likely to get it through the post with direct-to-consumer orthodontics. He looked at education, and education was shown to be significant. Those people who are higher educated were more likely to go to an orthodontist, and those who haven't been as educated were more likely to go to direct-to-consumer orthodontics. I thought these were amazing questions for Linda to ask at this point in time, and I think the answers to this particular study are poignant to us all as to, well, what do we need to do to educate patients? What do we need to do to understand what is determining patients' preferences? Next lecture was by Susan Cunningham, and it's about great expectations, understanding the patient's expectations in orthodontics. Now, for me, this topic is one where I understand the words of patient expectations, but don't know the depth behind it. And I think Susan Cunningham did a great job at explaining the depth of patient expectations and actually where we can then interact with this process to try and get better outcomes for patients. So you start off by saying, well, how do patients develop an expectation? And there are four key areas to it. It's about patients' previous experiences. It's about word of mouth and friends and family they've interacted with. It's about what they see around them in the media and also experiences of the impact due to their condition. Now, what is the relevance of this? Well, the expectations have been shown to actually determine the overall patient satisfaction from their treatment. And also the expectations that they come in with also determine the amount of engagement they have during treatment. So it's going to have clinical consequences to this, potentially. That was by Gassam in 2016. So what are the expectations specifically in orthodontics? Well, Yeo did a systematic review in 2016, which showed that actually it's the process of treatment and also the outcomes. Now, the process of treatment is about patients understanding their process of orthodontics. Now the outcomes of treatment I thought was more interesting. This was, well what do patients think are going to happen at the end of having orthodontic treatment? Now patients were asked that question and some stated that it was the appearance and function but actually there were other answers that were given which was interesting. One was about general well-being they thought would improve, the future dental health would be better but also an improvement in self-image. Now When we have a patient, what Susan proposed is that we need to try and put them into a category. So what we can ask these patients is, well, what impact do you think orthodontics is going to have on your life once you complete it? And she got three classifications, relatively simple. Patients with minimal expectations, moderate and marked expectations. I thought that was really quite insightful to divide patients up into those segments. So then you are able to then direct certain information to certain types of patients. And then Susan went on to describing the management of patients' expectations. Well, this is about asking them the questions and having a two-way road, putting them into that category of, well, what are your expectations? Where do you stand? It's important to be clear on meeting their expectations. Now, I think that's something which I am very much going to take from this lecture, is to tell them, well, yes, I can do this, or no, I can't do that, and making that clear rather than an implied piece of information. What she stated was important to be able to rank the patient's expectations. What is the most important thing to them? She spoke about giving high quality information to patients as well, but also having patients discuss treatment with other patients as well. That's a wrap for day two, guys. Just wanted to give my reflections about the lectures from the IOC day two and the types of changes that I'm going to look at after listening to these lectures in my clinical practice. Well, the first is looking at retention. So I'm going to start to think, well, actually, if patients didn't have these vacuum form retainers, have I got a stable result? Can I do something else to make it more stable? I'm going to look at combium CTs for impacted canines. Although I have them fortunate to have them available to me, should I be using them each and every time? I'm going to think about if I'm using RME combined with TADS, should I consider using the MSE approach? And also I'm going to start exploring patients' expectations further and being clear on whether or not we're going to achieve them. Future ideas I'm looking forward to seeing as evidence about the timing for impacted canine exposure and also photobiomodulation and its effect upon tooth movement. Guys, I hope you've enjoyed it. Please do subscribe and look forward to day three coming up soon.